Amen. Exodus chapter 28. So for the next few weeks on Sunday evenings, we're going to be looking at the garments of the high priest or the garments of the priest here. Now, the Bible is giving um, this whole chapter is just um, showing us, first of all, like the, de the great detail um, that God goes into um, with, you know, his directions to the priests. So you say, why, you know, is this um, important to us? Well, first of all, you know, we are kings um, and priests, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1. So these things all apply to us, and there's nothing in the Bible that's there by accident. Okay, so when there's things that are detailed out in the Bible, we should pay attention. There's always things that we can learn um, from this. Now, we look at the detail. I mean, this is just one of those examples in the Bible that just shows you, like, how great detail um, God uh, puts towards things. Look at all the garments, all the things that these priests, this priest is supposed to wear and how these things are supposed to look, what they're to be made of, and everything has a meaning um, for us um, to learn from. So we're, this morning... Um, we're going to kind of um, lead into the Sunday evening service with the service this morning, but we're going to talk in both services about the robe of the priest this morning and this evening. So the priest's robe is detailed out in verse number 31 through verse number 35. Let's just go ahead and read those um, verses. We see this great detail here. And by the way, these details, they're not something that God just is like, okay, you know, I think do it this way, and, uh, you know, no big deal. A couple times in this chapter, we see, look at verse 43. It says that they bear not iniquity and die. So this is a life and death situation for this priest that he has things, um, that he's wearing these things that have been built and manufactured and made um, in this specific way that God um, designed it to be. Look at verse 31 of Exodus chapter 28. We're looking at the robe of the priest. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod of all blue, and there shall be a hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof, and it shall have a binding of woven work around about the hole of it, as it were the hole of an habergeon, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and he, his sound shall be heard when he goeth into the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. Again, you know, important, you know, it's a life or death situation that it is done in this way. So this morning we're going to look at just one verse, and then tonight we'll look at the following verses. We're going to look at verse number 32. We're going to look at the purpose of the robe this morning. And tonight um, we'll look at the characteristics of the robe that are detailed out in the following verses. But in verse 32, the Bible says, And there shall be a hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof, and it shall have a binding woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of an habergeon, that it be not rent. So there's a lot listed here in verse number 32. This is what we're going to look at this morning. So first of all, the Bible here is saying that this, this uh, robe is going to have a hole in it, obviously, so you can, you can put it around yourself. But it's very detailed about what the, what the hole of this fabric, um, the details of it. It shall have a binding of woven work around about the whole of it. Why? So it's saying you're supposed to bind and, and, and wind woven. You're supposed, to, I don't, you're supposed to sew a hem around the hole as it were, the hole of an habergeon. A habergeon is a coat of chain mail. Okay, so if you've ever seen, like, you know, knights or a, a suit of armor, underneath the suit of armor many times, um, the knight, they would have cloth. Um, they'd have a cloth shirt. Then they would put um, the chain mail over the top of them. And then they would put the, the steel heavy armor of iron over the top of the chain mail. So chain mail, what it's explaining here is it's saying, you're to weave around the whole of this robe so it's like, it's like a shirt of chain mail. What does that mean? It says that it be not rent, so it won't tear. Okay, so it's saying you're to weave around. So if you just think about um, if your mom's ever hemmed your pants uh, before. So you go to a, a tailor and, you know, they have, uh, you try on pants and the pants are too long, so they need to hem the pants. They don't just take a scissors and just cut the pants, right? They... They tuck it under, and they sew it, and they, they hem the pants, because if you would just cut the pants, they would fray and they would tear. Okay, so the Bible here is pointing out, God is pointing out very specifically that the hole in this robe 
is to be woven or hemmed so it will be strong like chainmail, is what God is saying. So it'll be strong like chainmail, and it will not tear. You say, what's the big deal? Turn to John chapter 19. It's super important that this robe does not rip. You say, why? Let's look at that um, this morning. Let's look at what the Bible says about, you know, the tearing of fabric. Let's look at John chapter 19. Let's look at Christ's robe or Christ's coat in John chapter 19. There's something that's very specific that's pointed out um, about Christ's coat when he was being crucified on the cross and his, his clothing was being, you know, uh, was being sold and, and, and you know, people were, were taking it. Look at verse number 23 of John chapter 19. The Bible says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. So the coat wasn't, it wasn't made of uh, several different pieces of fabric. It was just one piece that was made the whole way through. Look at verse 24. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it. Let us not tear it up. They said, let's not cut it up, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. So again, it was not ripped. Christ's coat or his robe was not torn. Turn to Isaiah chapter 22. Let's look at kind of like what the robe um, pictures, what the robe pictures. Look at Isaiah chapter 22. So we see in Exodus chapter 28 that this robe is supposed to have a hole in it so you can get it um, you know, over your head and it's to have a hole in it and it is to be woven so it's not torn. Okay, look at Isaiah chapter 22. In Isaiah chapter 22, um, God is uh, rebuking Shebna. He's rebuking um, one of these servants of King Hezekiah and when he's rebuking um, this servant, he uses an interesting analogy in verse 21 where he says that he's going, to, he's going to give his responsibilities. He's going to give this servant of Hezekiah that's become lifted up, that's become prideful, that's become arrogant. He's going to give his responsibilities to somebody else. He's going to give his title to somebody else. Look at verse 21 of Isaiah chapter 22. The Bible says, And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So when he's talking about taking the responsibility away from this man Shebna and giving it to um, Elkiah, he's saying, I'm going, to clo- I'm going to give him your robe. He's like, he's going to get your robe, which means he's going to get your title. He's going to get your responsibilities. Okay, go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. So we see that this, this robe is, is to be an identity, a title, and it's not to be ripped. Okay. Now, the high priest is to wear this, but guess what? Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 14. The Bible says that Jesus has become our high priest now. Okay. Jesus has now become our high priest. Look at verse um, number 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So we see that the robe is important. We see that Jesus' robe was not torn. We see that the robe that the high priest wore was to be hemmed in a certain way to not allow it to be torn. And then we see that how a robe is to become your identity. A robe, you know, kind of signifies your title. So let's look at this idea now of torn clothing, okay? This idea of torn clothing. Why was it such a big deal that this robe did not tear? That Jesus' robe was not torn? Turn to 2 Kings chapter 22. Because look, the priest's robe was not to be torn. Jesus' robe was not torn. And we see that the robe itself, you know, has important meaning for a person's identity for their title, okay? But look, the Bible teaches again and again and again that tearing of clothing, Tearing of clothing signifies, it signifies destruction, it signifies 
tearing down. It signifies being brought low. It, it signifies, you know, bad things being um, done, bad things happening. Look at 2 Kings chapter 22. Here Josiah, this is just an example of a king who's found the book of the law. They've read the book of the law. And he hears the words of God and he realizes that these words of God are so different from what they have been doing in their kingdom that he's immediately just brought down to the ground. Look at verse number 10 of 2 Kings chapter 22. And Shaphan, Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest had delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. So they were fixing the temple, they found the Bible, they read the king the Bible, and look at verse 11. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. The king himself just took his clothes and he just tore his clothing. He's like, we're destroyed. We're, we haven't been doing any of this stuff, is what the king says. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 13. Let's look at an example where King David rent his clothes. Where David rents his clothes. So the king sees that we're in trouble. We're in a bad place. We are destroyed. God is going to destroy us and he just tears his clothes. Look at verse number 30 of 2 Samuel chapter 13. There's a lot of examples of people in the Bible renting their clothes. We'll just look at um, a few. So this is, of course, um, when David's son is killed by Absalom for, you know, the, the, the assault of his sister. But look at verse 30, 30 of 2 Samuel chapter 13. And it came to pass, when they were in the way, the tidings came to David saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons, and there was not one of them left. The king arose and tear his garments and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by their, with their clothes rent. So David thinks that all the sons were killed, not just, you know, Abnon. So he doesn't realize, you know, he gets, he gets bad news here. He gets poor, he gets fake news that all his sons are dead, and that's not the case. Instead, it was, it was just one of his sons that died, but as soon as he hears that, he's like, I'm destroyed. He's like, I'm destroyed, and he tears his clothes, and then all his servants also, they tear their clothes. They're like, this is bad. This is a horrible thing. Here's an interesting um, version of someone's clothing being rent. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. So what do we see about the robe. The robe signifies, you know, your title. It signifies, you know, you know your, your position, you know, your, who you are. And it being torn signifies you being destroyed, you being brought low. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24 and look at verse number 2. Now this story makes a little bit more sense to us. Look, any little detail in the Bible, you have to remember that any little detail in the Bible is there for a reason and it means something. God didn't just put things in the Bible just for fun, just so we can see some cool stories. They're in there for us to learn um, very specific doctrines. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse number 2. So Saul, he's hunting David now. Saul's trying to, David's already been anointed king. Saul's already had the kingdom taken from him. And Saul is just, he's gone insane, and he's just trying to kill David. Look at verse number 2. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel, and went to sink David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way where it was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. Okay, he went into, that's, that's Bible speak for he went in to use the restroom. Okay, so he goes to the cave to go and use the bathroom. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So here Saul comes into this cave, and David and his men, they're like hiding on the walls of the cave, and Saul goes in to um, use the restroom. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto me. Then David arose. They're, so they're like, they're like, we've got him. Here the king came in all by himself. He doesn't have to have um, any, um, he doesn't have any protection, any soldiers with him. Talk about if there's ever a vulnerable moment um, that, you know, you could be in. It's that one. And then David arose, and what did he do? He didn't kill Saul, but David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. So privately, it says he snuck up to Saul when he was, you know, using the restroom, and he cut off, 
you know, the, the bottom part of his skirt. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. So here he cut off the lower part of his robe. And David felt really bad about that. Why? Because he knew what that signified. Because he knew that that signified, you know, Saul being brought low, Saul being, you know, he's, he basically rent Saul's robe is what he did. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So, I mean, David, I mean, it kind of shows you David's heart right here. It shows you how humble David was. But it shows you the symbolism of what David did. Because David, here was God's anointed, which was David at this point. David was already anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And Saul, he lost the kingdom back in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel told him the same thing. But the point is, is that Saul had already lost the kingdom and David was already anointed as the new king by God. And here we see a picture of this with David literally renting the robe, you know, or, the, you know, he's basically renting the throne from Saul is what this pictures. Turn to Leviticus Chapter 19. All that to say this, rending is bad. Tearing is bad, especially the robe. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19. So look, I, you shouldn't walk around with ripped clothes. <laughs> I mean, there you go. Here's the sermon right there. No, but you shouldn't, I mean, you shouldn't walk around with ripped clothes. I remember, actually, this was a bigger deal than it is today because I remember that, a, you know, just my grandfather, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, as a kid, if you would have like ripped holes in your jeans or something, or it, it was like an embarrassment. It was an embarrassment. Like what? Can't you, can't, you know, why, why, why do you have a hole in your pants? I mean, it would be an embarrassment to my parents or grandparents if you would have kids walk around with holes in their pants. Like it was just like a, a dishonorable thing. Of course, that's a whole nother um, story of what's going on today. Mostly it's just to show, every, you know, show everyone your nakedness is what's going on today. But look, um, Leviticus chapter 19, look at uh, verse number 19. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse number 19. Look at, the, look at what the law says. You ever wondered why this, this seems like this is really obscure and people, you know, you hear people talk about this all the time, like why is this in the Bible? And I mean, this is my opinion why this is in the Bible, what we're talking about today. But in, in Leviticus chapter 19 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 22, we see a really weird, you know, kind of seemingly obscure rule about what you should wear. Look at verse number 19. Look, God cares what you wear. God cares how you look. Okay, look at verse 19. Ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. And then look at this last part. It says, neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. It's saying, it's saying you shouldn't wear a shirt or a garment or pants that's made of linen and wool. You say, why? Well, I mean, I think that there's some spiritual separation um, aspects there. But I mean, just from the practical sense of it, you know, linen is made from a plant. It's made from flax. And then wool is made from, obviously, you know, the wool of a sheep. But here's the thing. Wool shrinks and flax doesn't and linen doesn't. So if you make a shirt that's half wool and you're a, you know, you're a, a, a bar, or not a barber, but you're a, you're a tailor, and you make a shirt that's made of wool, and then you make a shirt that's made of, of linen for the bottom half, it's going to tear at those seams. It's going to tear. You're going to have ripped clothing, is what the Bible is saying here. So look, you're not to wear ripped clothing, because ripped clothing, I mean, wool shrinks and linen doesn't, it will result in this tearing. So we see that tearing torn clothes, it's a picture of shame, destruction, lowliness. Okay, we should think about that. I mean, you shouldn't walk around with ripped up clothes. Turn to Leviticus chapter 13. Here's another example of ripped clothes. It's not something that we should be, um, we should be wearing. I mean, it's, it's not something that is a good thing. Okay, it's something that's always pictured lowliness and destruction in the Bible, which is why there was so much detail put on the priest's robe that it would not tear. Okay, look at verse number 45, Leviticus chapter 13. The Bible says, and the leper in whom the plague is. This is like 
This is what happens if you have somebody that's, that's a leper, somebody that has a contagious disease. This is what you're supposed to do. This was the law, okay? And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be what? You're, you're to tear his clothes. Tear his clothes. Set him apart. Look, he is, his head is to be bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, shall he be defiled, his unclean, he shall dwell alone. I mean, this is just like practical quarantining advice right here for somebody that has a contagious disease. It's saying, tear his clothes, shave his head. Okay? So look, people look. I mean, so in, in old time Israel, if people would, if, if these people walking on the streets out here with all their jeans ripped up, people would be like, ah, they're a bunch of lepers. And they would run away. Because it's to set them apart and signify that they are to be by themselves. We need to be able to see that they're a leper. So the Bible is saying, do this and do this so everyone can know that they're a leper and stay away from them. I mean, it's trying to stop disease spreading in the nation. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Let's look at something else that was ripped, that was torn in the Bible. So we see that you know, it's, it's practical. We see that, you know, God doesn't want clothing ripped. It, it, it has spiritual meaning to it. And it also, it, it signifies that you're destroyed. Okay? Look at verse number 51 of Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse 51 of Matthew chapter 27. The Bible says, and behold, this is right after Jesus died. Okay? And what happened? So we remember that there is a veil... We'll talk about that specifically tonight, but there's a veil in the temple that goes into the holy place of the temple and where only the high priest could go. Only the high priest could go there. And that veil, look at verse 51, it says, Behold, right after Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was what? It was rent. It was torn in twain, torn in two, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The rocks broke as well. But the veil was torn. What does that mean? The veil was destroyed. The veil was taken away. Okay, we'll talk about that in detail tonight. But look, to be torn, to have a piece of fabric torn means the person wearing it is destroyed. It's, it signifies destruction. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 61. Let's look at the robe itself. Let's look at the robe of the priest itself. This is really what the robe pictures. This is really what the robe pictures. Look at Isaiah chapter 61 and look at verse number 10. Or look at the front of your bulletin. It's the verse of the week. The Bible says in Isaiah 61 and verse number 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me. So he's saying, you are clothed in salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Now we see the importance of why this particular robe is not to be torn. What it pictures, what the priest's robe pictures, that it's not torn, is it pictures your righteousness. You are saved not because you are good, not because you are, you know, doing good works or whatever of your own. You are clothed with Christ's righteousness. And that is what this robe pictures. He covers us with the robe of righteousness. So when God sees you, when you die and you go to heaven and you stand before God, God will not see your righteousness. He will see the robe of righteousness that you have been covered with. That is what this pictures. And look, that can't be torn. That won't be torn. It will not be ripped. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. It pictures us covered in Jesus' righteousness, which, by the way, will have no tears and no end. It's a picture. Look, it's really a picture of eternal security, if you want to think of it that way. This idea that this robe is woven and will not be torn is a picture of our eternal security, our righteousness in Christ. Look at verse number 6 of Jeremiah chapter 23. Because, look, it doesn't, I mean, I hope that, I hope you get saved and I hope you get your life right and we'll talk about that um, towards the end of the sermon, but it's never going to be your righteousness that gets you to heaven. It's the Lord's righteousness. Look at Jeremiah 23, 6. 
It says, in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And in, the, and in his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's what you could call Jesus. You could call Jesus the Lord our righteousness, because your righteousness is Jesus' righteousness. Amen. Romans 4, 5 says, But him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So look, it's never going to be your righteousness that gets you to heaven. It's going to be your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ that is your righteousness. It's things that are counted for your right righteousness. It's, it's not ours. Okay, it's not ours. It's not just like, you know, we don't go to the door and tell people that, because that, look, isn't that what everybody believes? Everybody believes that it's their righteousness that's going to get them to heaven. You think you're going to go to heaven? The people that are like super confident that they're going to heaven, they're, they're confident that they're going to, the people that are unsaved that are super confident that they're going to heaven, they think they're pretty good. That's why. They think that they're pretty righteous. But there's none righteous. There's none righteous. No, not one. This is not, this is not, this, this robe of the priest is, is, is picturing Jesus' righteousness being covered onto us. Okay, it's not, salvation is not a repair. It's not a repair of your righteousness. Our righteousness is a complete replacement. It's Jesus' righteousness being put upon you. Go to Matthew chapter 9. Go to Matthew chapter 9. It's a complete replacement because your righteousness is no good. It doesn't exist. Okay? There is none righteous. Look at verse number 16 of Matthew chapter 9. So the robe of the priest, it pictures Christ's robe. It wasn't, it wasn't torn. Okay? It pictures, and more completely, it pictures, pictures his righteousness put on us. But look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 16. Now this verse um, hopefully will make, be a little bit more interesting to you now that you know um, the importance of this garment, this righteousness being put upon us, and that it's not rent, that it's not ripped. But look at verse number 16 of Matthew chapter 9. It says, No man put a piece of new, put a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. You know what this is saying? It says no one would take, um, no one would take, so like I ripped up my jeans, I ripped my old jeans, and no one would take a piece of, uh, this is actually true, by the way, because like if you've ever like had somebody who used to patch pants or patch, um, you know, clothing, you would never take, like my mom would always like keep old jeans around. She would always keep old jeans around because if she needed to make a patch, yeah, she patched our pants. If she needed to make a patch, you don't want to patch like a patch with a new patch because then it'll shrink again and it'll, it'll make a tear. It'll, it'll tear. So the Bible here is saying is that nobody takes a piece of new cloth and patches an old garment with a piece of new cloth because it's just going to tear. Okay, that's why, look, that's why the Bible says, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. That's why the Bible, but Jesus is, is, is explaining a bigger truth here. He's explaining that, that you are not to just take an old garment and just put new patches on it in your life. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 24. The Bible says when you get saved, like when you get saved, this is what you're supposed to do. When you get saved and you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved in that moment, look at verse 24. It says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Look, he's not saying, like, patch the old man. He's saying, put on a brand new man. This, this is the problem with many Christians today right here. Is people, like, sometimes I see that it's hard for people to embrace this Christian life, to embrace this, because they never really figure out what this means right here in Matthew chapter 9, and in Ephesians chapter 4. You know, they, this, is, this is the guy that's going to, you know, he gets saved. And he's going to like dip his toes into the Christian life. He's going to kind of feel it out a little bit. 
and see how things go. But what that guy is doing is he's taking new patches and he's putting them on an old garment. And, and you know what he's going to do? He's just going to, you know what, he's like, I'm going to modify the old man. You say, that sounds pretty good to modify the old man, maybe get some things out of my life here and there, and I'm going to modify the old man, but here's the thing, it's not going to work. Why? Because you're just going to like, you're going to get a bunch of tears in all the patches, all the brand new patches that you put on the old man. They're going to tear. That's what Jesus is telling you in Matthew chapter 9. That's why, look, that's why the Christian life is best. It's just if, when, it's served, when, you, when you're just all in. It's really the only way it works is what Matthew chapter 9 is saying. If you ever heard Pastor Jimenez say, Pastor Jimenez has said this in sermons many times when we were going to church at Verity. But he, he, says, he says, I feel like I've pastored several different churches at this point. I mean, he was, maybe when he said that, he was maybe seven, eight years into his ministry, and he says, I feel like I've pastored several different churches. And the reason for that is because the average Christian life, they say, is about two to three years long. You say, why is that? Why after two to three years do people just fall out of the Christian life? Here's why. Because people are just, they're just putting patches on. Somebody, they quit drinking. They quit drinking. Hey, great. Great. Good job. But then they just keep going to the same places. They keep having the same life. They have the same friends. All these things. They're just putting patches on, and those patches are going to tear. Those patches are going to tear. It's somebody that, you know, it just, you know, they go to the same places. It's somebody that, that maybe they get saved, and they're like, you know what? I'm going to take my life that's right now. I'm going to take the old man, and I'm going to add church. Church is a patch. It's not going to work. I mean, great. I mean, it's going to tear, though. It's going to tear. That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 9. And just because you're putting it on the same garment, it's just going to keep tearing. And then, you know, it tears, and they put another patch on, and then pretty soon they got patches on top of patches. And look, here's the thing. It just turned to Romans chapter 6. It just gets irritating. They're just constantly repairing patches everywhere. Constantly repairing patches. Look at Romans chapter 6. And look at verse number four. Because they're patching the same old garment. Look at verse number four of Romans chapter six. This is why in Romans chapter six, when Jesus is talking about, look, the first thing you do after you get saved, you should get baptized. But look at what it says about baptism right here. It says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ Jesus was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Lord, even so all, we also should walk in like... Uh, a, a modified life. We should walk in an improved life. We should walk in a patched life. No, you should walk in newness of life, Amen. is what the Bible says. But here's the thing. The reason these people quit after two or three years, and the reason that you know, that church and this church will probably look different in two or three years, is because people are just using patches. And after so many patches, they just get tired and they just throw the whole thing away. Like somebody is just constantly just taping this old, you know, you got a pair of cowboy boots with all these holes, and you're just taping it and patching it and taping it. It's like, why don't you just get a new pair of boots? That's what Jesus is saying. But then the problem is, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the problem is, is that when those people, they get tired of patching, and they just, see, they never tried the new garment. That's the problem. And it's sad to see, as a, as a pastor, you have the perspective, you can really see that. They never try the new garment, and then they throw the whole thing away, and then they go back and they, go, they get way worse than they ever were. Just again and again and again, it's the same story. I mean, it gets, it gets boring, but this is what the Bible, I mean, this was Saul's whole life. This was King Saul's whole life. Just, he would get better, and he would apologize, and then he would just get worse. It would just get worse. But it, look, it, it's dangerous because you, you, you garnish and sweep the house to a degree, and then you just get seven times worse, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12. When they never tried the new one. That's, that's what just kills me. When they never tried the new one. Look, you've got to think about, that's why the Bible says, born again. When you get saved, 
You're born again, and you're to walk in newness of life, not, not become a teenager. You're not, you're not a teenager again. It says you're born again. It's trying to just portray this, this newness that you are supposed to be in. Look, we see it's all about, really, it's all about the desire to have a consistent life is what it is. And I, I mean, to me, I, I always wanted to be consistent. I mean, we see, look, we see inconsistency in beliefs all the time. If you go soul winning, you will see inconsistency to see in people's beliefs. You'll go out there and look, some people just don't have the desire to have consistent beliefs. But the people that have a desire to have consistent beliefs, beliefs that make sense, What's an inconsistent belief? Here's an inconsistent belief. How, how do you know you're going to heaven? Um, because uh, faith in Jesus. But I also have to be good and go, get baptized and go to church three times a week and all these different things and, and whatever. It's like, no, you, you, it's either faith in Jesus or works. It's either, it's either faith or works. Which one is it? They're like both, but faith. That's an inconsistent belief. If you go soul winning, you will find those people every time you go. Every time you go so many people that just don't seem to have that in, they don't sit down with themselves and their thoughts and their beliefs and decide, you know what, I'm going to have consistent beliefs. I want to be able to read the Bible and I want to be able to have the Bible make sense to me and I want to be able to, you know, have beliefs that are consistent in my heart and in my mind. Those people, if, if somebody is honestly looking for consistent beliefs in their life, those people will get saved for sure. Because the Bible is just, I mean, the, the gospel is just completely consistent. It's just, it's not by those things. It's by trusting in Jesus. That's it. And then, and then it's not, it's not about I have to trust in Jesus and then I get saved and then I got to do those things to stay saved. No, it's completely consistent. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That's the only consistency. But so people that want to have consistent beliefs, they will get saved. But then you want to have... You, you, there's so many people out there, they get saved, but they just don't have to have, they just, they, they don't seem to have to need, cons, you know, consistent actions in their life. So they end up with all these patches where they just have, like, you think about, if you're, what am I talking about? Think about any, any struggles you have in your Christian life. Think about any areas in your Christian life where you could be a hypocrite. Basically, when Jesus was talking about hypocrisy, and if you have hypocrisy in your life, that's where there's a patch that's tearing. Okay, that's the problem. You ha to have a consistent Christian life, you have to get a new garment. You have to be a new man. And look, there's going to be struggles along the way, but the point is, is it's brand new. You're not patching something that's old. Okay, and look, I mean, you will have struggles in the Christian life. But the struggles in your Christian life should come from, should come from people not liking that new garment. That's where they're going to come from. It should be, you put on a new garment, and you're like, hey, this is my life now. This is my Christian life now. This is what I'm doing. And it's like, people won't like it. But those are the normal struggles of the Christian life, of the person that's put on the new garment. You shouldn't be, if you're struggling with hypocrisy in your own life, it's because you're patching old clothes is what the Bible is telling us here, okay? I mean, in Acts chapter 5, we just studied Acts chapter 5, and we just made it all the way through the end. Go, go to Acts chapter 5. Go to Acts chapter 5. The, the Christians in Acts chapter 5, they had some struggles. But the struggles that the Christians in Acts chapter 5 had, it wasn't because they were patching old garments. They had some struggles because they were new men. They were new men, and there was a lot of people that didn't like the fact that they were new men. And so how did they handle that? How do they handle that? Look at the verse 50, 51, 41, I'm sorry. Verse 41 of Acts chapter 5. The Bible says, and they departed. So here they'd, they had been put in prison. They had been beaten. They had been put in prison a couple times at this point. And it says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That is the struggle you should have in your Christian life. Right there. Not because you're trying to duct tape some old, torn up piece of garbage that you were wearing before you even got saved. Throw the patch kit away. Just get a new garment. That's what the Bible is telling us here. Okay, so look. First of all, the robe of the priest, it's, it's a salvation picture. It's a salvation picture that this robe is to cover the priest and is to not be 
torn. It's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of our eternal security. That this robe is like a robe of Christ's righteousness put over us. It's not ours. It's something that we have been given. And then it's a reminder to us as well that we are to have a new garment. We are not to just try to keep the old garment that we had and just patch it and patch it and patch it. Because look, folks, let me just read the, let me just uh, predict the future for you. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're supposed to walk in newness of life. And look, in, in, in that point, once you just decide, I'm going to be a new man, you're not going to say you're not going to be struggling. But here's the thing. Notice, notice in Matthew chapter 9, notice how it didn't say that they had a, notice how it didn't, it didn't give the scenario of having a new garment and putting an old patch on it. You say, well, if I get a new garment, am I going to have to patch it? Well, have you ever had to do that? You ever bought a new shirt and had to patch it the next day? Maybe Jacob has. But have you ever bought something new and then had to patch it with an old patch? No, because it's new. You won't have to patch it. That's the whole point of putting on the new garment. So that, that's why you see the things that you see. That's why churches look different after five years, after eight years, after 12 years. Because people are just duct taping themselves. And you can do that until you get annoyed and it gets irritating. But you're supposed to put on a new garment and then you don't have to patch it all the time. Yeah, you might have trouble because people aren't going to like that new garment. They're like, I don't like that. They're like, hey, praise God. <laughs> you don't like it. Just like Acts chapter 5 and verse 41. So tonight we'll look at the characteristics. We'll look at all these strange things about this robe. So we see what the robe pictures, that it pictures Christ's righteousness put on us. Tonight we'll look at the pomegranates, we'll look at the bells, we'll look at the color of the robe and see what that shows us as well. Super interesting stuff, folks. Nothing in the Bible is on accident. And it is beautiful how the Old Testament just fits perfectly with the New Testament. That's how we know that like these fishermen, if, somebody, if these fishermen wrote the Bible, they must have been geniuses to figure out all these connections and to figure out all this. But look, God wrote the Bible. And God put every detail in the Old Testament to show us things that apply to us today. And the robe is a perfect example of that. We'll look at it in more detail this evening. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.